Hello, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. We have a few new insights from our new clinical trial and a few summaries uh, that we'd like to share from the previous trial. Our volunteers of our first study, Biolab study, we included PATM, included people that couldn't smell themselves, and included those that could. Some of them could identify their odor as breath odor, so they were absolutely sure that it was their breath, or maybe it could be mouth, could be nose. And others were absolutely sure that it was their body odor. Sometimes they could, or at least try to pinpoint the exact uh, source uh, on the body, sometimes they couldn't, sometimes they also had bad breath, but that was kind of secondary. And so what we found is that one of our tests was able to clearly separate those groups, so bad breath and bad body odor, based on intestinal permeability tests. Those with increased permeability tended to be uh, exhibiting body odor, and those with decreased uh, compared to normal actually exhibited um, bad breath. Definitely, this test cannot be used uh, to diagnose body odor, but um, at least it can show and demonstrate that the sufferers actually, whatever they are exhibiting is real, and they can very accurately pinpoint the source, which is also very important because you need to go through a lot of denial uh, before they even believe that you have a problem. I hopefully will be able to publish it um, soon. But you need to pay actually a lot of money uh, to publish, but we are trying to find alternative ways. Neither of the many tests we used uh, for the biolab study uh, had sufficient diagnostic um, power. Even though some of those tests, such as the glucose challenge test and uh, the urine indicance test, was positive in more than half of the participants. However, by combining those tests, and there is a statistical procedure that does it, it's called principal component analysis, uh, we were able to look at all those data and identify patterns. And it showed us that there were clearly at least two, or more likely three groups in our data set. We call them sweet and sour group. And um, the colors uh, represent the others experienced by the participants, which shows that uh, the others are also a very reliable symptom. And the colors actually show, uh, starting from the lightest, garbage-like odors, followed by fishy, ammonia, sour odors like sour acetone. Uh, those are odors associated with alcoholism. And fecal diarrhea, followed by generic fecal odor. So those are the darkest three circles in the sour cluster. The sweet group um, symptom keywords mostly include sweetish sulfur smells, the others from the lightest to the darkest are sulfur, rotten vegetables, rotten eggs, cheesy, sweaty, fecal, sewage, smoke like gasoline, burning. And the darkest circles are those who couldn't smell themselves. And finally, the PATM condition that does cluster with our um, body at a group. A lot more interesting observations about this, but not much time to talk about it. Uh, one of them is that the sweet group did have more added sugar in their diet. They were more likely to experience uh, uh, improvement in symptoms when they reduced uh, sweet intake. Participants from the sweet group were more likely to improve with probiotics, but of course it was more complicated than that. So the main conclusion was that we definitely need a more comprehensive metabolomic analysis. And thankfully, Dr. Wishard helped us to do that. Here is our latest study. Dr. Wishard and his team from Alberta, um, they are doing it completely uh, for no charge. And of course, we thank our volunteers too for participation, for um, doing this experiment and for paying postage. Uh, I, I want to emphasize 
one thing that metabolomics that's a very um, interesting emerging very uh, very important and promising discipline but the problem is that the range of metabolites concentrations in samples is so large and the different properties of metabolites are so diverse that it is almost impossible to measure the complete metabolome with only one technique and uh, you know another limitation is that we usually do need to compromise on either the scope of the experiment or the completeness of the measurements and you know also if we only look at um, some types of chemicals like amino acids these experiments will have reduced statistical power because we also need to look at the products and so the results I will be talking about are very preliminary uh, the only experiment that was done so far was direct flow injection mass spectrometry that you can go to TMIC website, the Metabolomics Innovation Center's website and see what exactly compounds um, uh, this technique uh, can find and it's mostly amino acids, glycerol phospholipids and acyl carnitins. Um, so I've looked at these preliminary results with several statistical techniques uh, to bring out strong patterns in the data set and uh, I'm showing results of principal component, principal component analysis, similar analysis that I uh, showed you for the previous clinical trials. So here are the results. Again, you see that there are obviously more than one group. But of course, it's too early to say um, what exactly the subgroups are. And I would appreciate if uh, the volunteers of the study that can see their numbers here, actually, and as here next to the dots representing, persi representing persi participants, could um, uh, help me in uh, adding, uh, in giving additional data as we will be clustering and we will be trying to make sense of it. Uh, the main uh, result of the study so far is that uh, we don't have any abnormalities, so there are no, there are no um, known metabolic deficiencies that could be seen. Everything is normal, but it is still different from control. You see that control, an average control a person without the order, is located a little bit above uh, this box, so outside of the box, and um, the participants were uh, red uh, is um, secondary TMAU, uh, salmon is actually borderline TMAU, blue are participants with normal results, some tested twice, and yellow are um, those that hadn't yet tested for TMAU. Unfortunately, we had actually two, we had two more samples, uh, one a TMAU, another normal, that um, uh, one is being processed again and another uh, was damaged in the mail, so we couldn't include it. Most interesting metabolites that showed largest variability among uh, MIBO volunteers of the study uh, and also metabolites uh, that show difference from controls are taurine, amino adipic acid, those are biogenic amines, important nitrogen compounds affecting nervous system, blood pressure, body temperature and many other bodily processes, and amino acids, histidine, glutamine, serine, alanine, glycine, aspartic acid and tyrosine. And I'm showing just a few examples. Again, this is very preliminary and it's best not to put too much into it because we'll keep working on it and we'll have much better you know, understanding what exactly is happening. So histidine, here's an example. You see that in control group average is about 43, while in MIBA group it's much less. Uh, and uh, there are actually two peaks. Um, so uh, there are people with average value of histidine that is below average in control and another group that is above uh, taurine. So here we have a much narrower peak, narrower peak and average is 23 versus 82. Lysine, 
same thing here. It's a much narrower peak and also there, are, there is less lysine on average in urine of our volunteers than in control. Be happy to answer any questions and tell you more about it. I hope that we together we will be able to make the study a success. Thank you. That's all for today. Um, but uh, please do stay tuned for more.